Professor Taylor, good morning. You good are, morning, Joseph. <laughs> you are one of the leading experts on uh, the HED in Europe, and also... Thank oh. you. Thank <laughs> you. And uh, so, uh, I would like to ask your opinion, and what is the state of the art in the assessment of uh, ADHD uh, children. Eh? As uh, you know, uh, ADHD is not a disease, it's, it's a syndrome. And uh, the need of a clear diagnosis and uh, objective indexes are very much uh, in need for the clinicians to have uh, uh, instrumentation for objective and guiding therapy also. So, uh, well, I would like to know your opinion about the new uh, frontiers uh, related to neuropsychology and uh, neuroimaging techniques and how they can help in the diagnosis and treatment of these children. Oh. Well, as you, as oh, you have already. I have this already, good. As you say, Giuseppe, the... Um, uh, it is at present, it's an entirely clinical diagnosis. It's made entirely by the behaviour of the children. Um, and correspondingly, it's a rather fuzzy diagnosis. Uh, it does not explain. It's a descriptive diagnosis. And it would be good to get to the level of an explanatory diagnosis. Uh, the, I think our best hopes of doing that uh, look as if they're around the neuropsychology and the neurophysiology of the disorder where there are some very robust findings, and where, by contrast with most complex psychiatric conditions, uh, we're finding uh, well-replicated uh, uh, deficiencies in the performance of children with ADHD. Now, I think for a long time, the research in that was trying to find one single fault. It was trying to find the single deficit which explained ADHD. And probably there is no such single deficit. The, um, certainly in the clinic, uh, I think I see many children uh, with ADHD. They nearly all have some abnormality in the neuropsychological performance, but it is not a consistent abnormality. Some are unable to hold themselves back. They can't restrain themselves from the next choice. They have a kind of fixed impulsiveness. Yeah. And then there are others who can do it, but they're very reluctant to do it. It's as if there was a motivation that meant that waiting is horrible for them. Uh, so they do anything they can to avoid waiting. They're impatient rather than deficient. Mm -hmm. And then there are others who find it very hard to plan ahead properly. The, uh, so I think that there are a whole series of different neuropsychological changes. And one of the goals for the future is going to be to describe those in enough detail that we can analyse the individual case. So it may come that we can say this child has a frontostriatal deficiency in inhibition. This child has a limbic uh, change uh, so that the, uh, the motivation to inhibit does not get through to the actual process of inhibition. So the hope is uh, uh, to subtype the children that you described in more uh, neurophysiopathological terms. Yes, just so. I, mean, yes. The, I think that's probably the key level at which we shall come to understand it. There will be others. There'll be the genetic level. Yeah. Uh, and um, and no doubt we shall be able to do genotyping for the individual child. Um, but I doubt if that will give us the, uh, the deeper understanding of the individual child's changes, because the pathway from the gene to behavior is a long, complex, and uh, one that we m it, it may take us many, many years to understand. Yes, and uh, uh, for this purpose, in our clinic, we use the epigenetic probabilistic model of Gilbert Gottlieb, Yes. Where he nicely explains the interactions no, and the probabilistic, both top down and bottom up interactions yes. of genetic and behavior. And the outcome is just a probabilistic, uh, uh, it's a probabilistic term, how they develop along the lifespan. Yes. And of course, what you inherit is not a fixed. Uh, inability to do things. I'm sure that what you usually inherit is a disposition to react in certain ways to certain environments. Yes. So the, uh, the kinds of interactions that are emerging, for instance, of the dopamine receptor uh, uh, variant alleles with exposure to alcohol in pregnancy, um, 
or with catechol orthomethyltransferase and its interaction with birth weight. Um, these are suggesting that there are some genes which only have a deleterious effect if you meet a certain kind of environment, and equally some kinds of environment that only have a harmful effect if you have certain kinds of genetic yes, variants. It's the idea of equipotentiality and the equifinality of yes. uh, the nervous system. Yes. And uh, there are uh, new techniques now, like neuroimaging technique and functional MRI. How do you think they can help in, uh, this, uh, in understanding this uh, ADHD syndrome? I think that um, I think there's a revolution in, in progress. I think that the brain is starting to reveal its secrets that for a long time, child psychiatry couldn't share in the advances of biological psychiatry because you could not do the detailed imaging of children's brains. Um, there were advances in the EEG and in the analysis of the response potential, uh, but it was hard to tie that down to good localization within the brain. And I think the coming of magnetic resonance imaging uh, has shown that with a non-invasive technique, uh, we can look at the same kind of detail of children's brains in psychiatric disorder that the adult psychiatrists have been able to do in the mental illnesses with such success. So I see it as a, as a profound change in, in our understanding. Yes. Also, now there are techniques in the neurophysiology no, applied to quantify the EG, uh, like Varetta and Loretta. They can also do some source localization. How do you think they could help in the future and guide the treatment? I think it, what is likely to happen is that probably the, um, uh, the structural and the functional MRI techniques will provide a kind of a gold standard. Yes. Uh, they will say, for instance, that the, uh, that the parts of the brain involved in inhibition are right frontal, projecting down to striatum, thalamus. Uh, and then when that's been worked out, we shall then find that there is a cheaper and simpler and more acceptable uh, methodology in which localizing EEG and multi-electrode arrays will be able to be applied to the individual case. So I see it very much as the applied arm um, of the basic science. Yes, and uh, this is what we are looking forward you know, to, the definitely to find the gold standards yeah. that also with the clinical observation, you know, can we make a, a more definite uh, diagnosis. Yes. Thank you very much, Professor Taylor. Thank yes. you. Thank, Thank you. you.